David Gordon is Professor and Director of the School of Urban and Regional Planning at Canada's Queen's University. Prior to returning to Queen's, he was principal in a prominent Toronto urban design and architecture firm and twice shared the Canadian Institute of Planners National Award of Distinction. He's received degrees in civil engineering and urban planning from Queen's and, the, and an MBA and doctorate in design from Harvard University. David teaches planning history, community design and urban development at Queen's. He's also taught at a number of other universities, including the University of Toronto, Harvard and the University of Pennsylvania, where he was a Fulbright senior scholar. He has written widely on urban planning and his research is, is quite groundbreaking in urban design. Among his books is Planning 20th Century Capital Cities, which was published in 2006, and Planning Canadian Communities, which is published this year, 2013. He's here to address us on Ottawa and Canberra as symbolic federal capitals. Please welcome Professor David Gordon. Well, it's a great honour to be here. This is my third visit to Canberra and I'm especially uh, grateful for the support of the High Commission and the Capitals Alliance. Um, I uh, spoke at the original uh, meeting and uh, that was the beginning of a research project on a book about capital cities around the world. Let's see if I can master this technology. Oh, we seem to be at the end of the presentation rather than the beginning. That was fast, you can make a crowd. <laughs> It's the sort of thing my students would do. <laughs> so, uh, three parts to the presentation. The uh, planning 20th century capital cities, a bit about the book. This is the second edition's cover. Uh, planning Ottawa as a symbolic capital and lessons for implementing federal capitals overall. And the book, and this is the cover that I designed uh, uh, with the uh, I think much more interesting, my English publisher thought the Canary Wharf is the right thing to put on for the capital of London. And uh, the book had an all-star cast of scholars, including my colleague Christopher Vernon from UWA, uh, writing about Canberra. And we looked at several types of capital cities. We thought of capital city as an urban area containing the seat of government for a nation state, a province, or a supranational organization like the European Union. Most capital cities contained unique elements, which we discovered during our research. And capital cities had particularly and peculiar planning issues that are different from other cities. So, what did we, where did we look? We looked at Paris, Moscow, Helsinki, London. We chose cities by their type and the ones that did interesting planning during the 20th century. So Tokyo, where they planned to actually move the capital out of the city to make room for its commercial expansion. Berlin, very contested site. Rome, dreadfully difficult to get the Italians to write about uh, Mussolini era. Washington. Canberra, Delhi, Ottawa, Brasilia, Chandigarh, New York, the capital of capital, and the United Nations as well. Brussels, not so much for the capital of Belgium, although it's a very interesting place to Canada, a lot of similar problems with language and culture. But because of its role as the capital, sort of, of the European Union. And capital cities have peculiar planning issues related to official residences, embassy districts, memorials, monuments, cultural facilities. And one of the things we did was look carefully at them and try to figure out what were the things that you found in every capital city and then in some of them. So obviously, you usually see a seat of government building. Uh, you see key de departmental headquarters and the official residence of the head of state, Buckingham Palace, 
as opposed to, say, the official residence of the chief political leader, like 10 Downing Street. I understand Canberra has both. Washington has one because it has both the, the chief political leader and the head of state are the same. And some places have neither, like uh, Bern. Places of assembly for national celebrations you usually have, like just uh, uh, Bon Fête de Canada, and still in two time zones, it's Canada Day. <laughs> and uh, I just got Skype back from my daughter who said the fireworks were terrific uh, at her home in Canada. Uh, there's a place of assembly, there's probably 200,000 people on Parliament Hill right now uh, for a really good show. And, uh, there's embassies, legations, councillor offices are usually in the capital city. And there's often the final court of appeal, but in some places like the European Union or in Switzerland, it might be in a different city or in uh, Germany. You almost always have repositories of national culture, starting off usually with one multi-purpose building that just keeps splitting and turning into more and more different types of museums and assembly halls. You usually have political and cultural visitors facilities because you have, in a federal capital especially, you want people coming in to visit. You usually have memorials and monuments and plan, problems planning all of these things. You usually have government departmental offices, but be careful what you wish for. Because if you had a high-speed train, uh, connecting yourself to Sydney, you might find that all of your offices were in Sydney, um, like they are in, to a large part in Switzerland, where they got the high-speed train under the mar mountains. It's 45 or 50 minutes from Zurich to Bern, and there are no uh, NGO offices um, and very few capital elements in the capital city of Switzerland. You often have a national place of worship, particularly if there's a national religion. Or you, have a, you often have a national bank, a central bank. You sometimes have national cultural venues, but sometimes not. So if the capital is not the major cultural center for the country, the opera house might be in a large city elsewhere, like it is in Canada. Uh, the great theater district might be in another city, like it is in New York music halls, ballet theaters, and the sports stadia, the national sports stadia, might be in the capital city, such as Stade de France, or it might be somewhere else. Things you sometimes find in a capital, there's often a research institute, like the National Research Council in Ottawa, or the original incarnation of the ANU. Um, sometimes there's a major university, but often it was thought to Good to keep those professors and students at some distance, like at Oxford and Cambridge. Um, there is sometimes a major religious headquarters, but again, it's sometimes thought to be better to keep the clerics at some distance, um, like at uh, Canterbury. And sometimes there's a city hall and even a mayor's residence, but sometimes not, because sometimes there isn't a local government. And you get the usual stuff. You get parks and transportation systems and residential areas and retail and shopping facilities. The parks are grander in a capital. The transportation systems are designed to be great gateways. But eventually capital planning agencies decide that they'll leave the planning of the retail and the residential and a lot of the parks to the local governments. But it often takes a century or so to come to that realization. Things that you usually don't find in a capital, according to our research, you usually don't find private corporation headquarters. There's usually a commercial center, and the headquarters of the Fortune 500 companies are at some distance. Now, this is changes as things become more, as capitals become more mature, and there's spin-off companies. You usually don't find the stock exchange or bourse in the capital city. It's usually in the commercial center. And you usually don't find large, smoky industrial complexes in the capital city because they're, A, they emerged elsewhere, and B, they're kept at a bit of a distance for aesthetic reasons. So, where are we? They have these unique planning 
issues. And in the newer capitals, like Brasilia and Canberra, it was fairly simple to identify these unique planning issues, because that's the way the plans were oriented. But as cities like New Delhi and Washington mature and expand into major metropoli in the late 20th century, the profile of planning for capitals became a little less distinct. You know, London could care less about the fact that it's a capital city. It's so busy chasing Tokyo and New York to make sure that it's number one in the finance. Uh, that's why they put Canary Wharf on the cover of the book. So capital city planning issues are almost buried in global cities. Tokyo was willing to move the capital out of the city into you know, 200, 300 kilometers away to make it work better as a commercial metropolis. So they had infrastructure for the seat of government in place by 1900. In the 20th century, they occasionally worried about embassy districts and security, but most of the time, they're busy trying to be globally dominant in finance and culture. So, moving on, second part of the lecture. How about Ottawa? Town and Crown. It's the title of my book out on Ottawa next year. That would be, town would be backyard, right? And Crown would be front yard. And uh, so these are eternal issues in the planning of federal cities and capital cities. And building a capital city is a complex and very long-term undertaking. It must work on at least these two levels. And like all cities, a national or federal capital needs to be functional and attractive, and I'm not going to talk about that. That's standard town planning stuff. These are the local government, town, or front backyard issues. I'm going to today meet symbolic, talk about meeting symbolic and functional needs of its resident government, crown, or front yard, um, because I'm focusing on this theme to fit the theme of this symposium on symbolism. The tensions between these town and crown rules are absolutely normal and found in every capital city, federal capital, um, and every new capital. And they've proved especially complicated for Canada's seat of government. The evolving Canadian cultural context adds a further challenge because the capital must move beyond representing the original Aboriginal, French, and Anglo sta stakeholders to reflect a more multicultural society. So, planning symbolic capital. So, Washington, Canberra, Brasilia, New Delhi, Ottawa, these are federal capitals, but also symbolic capitals. Uh, capitals where there's been a great deal of work to do in the 20th century to express their role as the capital city of the country. And capital cities need to be more than functional, efficient places. The nation states, if they're going to invest in these cities, have higher order objectives for their seat of government especially if it's a symbolic capital like these, as opposed to the metropolitan capitals like London or Tokyo. What distinguishes these new political capitals is that they're intended to be a tool for nation building. The best capital city design can showcase the cultural and democratic values of the sponsoring government, such as Paris's Grand Projet, or the Lincoln, Jefferson, and Vietnam War Memorials in the Mall in Washington. Similarly, L'Enfant's design for Washington physically captured the separation of the executive and the legislative branches of the USA's government system through the siting, of course, of the Capitol and the White House. However, Washington or Paris might not be good models for planning Ottawa, not only because their sites are different, but because the American, French, and Canada are, uh, countries, the nation states, are quite different. Canada is a bilingual, multicultural, federal state with three founding peoples and the world's largest and most diverse complement of new immigrants. Building a capital city that reflects this diversity is not an easy task, especially in a federation with a constitutional history red, riddled with tension. Now, Ottawa started with an exceptionally beautiful site. Three rivers, high cliffs, waterfalls, and it was completely ruined by industrial development in the 19th century. The forests were clear cut, the islands were covered with lumber mills, the Chaudière Falls dammed, the air was filled with sulfurous fumes and the mighty river's water rendered poisonous by human and industrial waste. The parliament buildings 
were the only hint of an ambition to create a capital worthy of the nation. And the Canadian capital was a really sorry looking place at the end of World War II. It was only in the late 1940s that the federal government, led by William Lyon Mackenzie King, who'd lived in the city since 1900, didn't like it much at first, got serious about creating a capital worthy of the nation. One of the most important achievements in recent decades, according to my colleague Larry Vale, analyst of capital cities, was Confederation Boulevard, which refocuses the major institutions around the much abused Ottawa River. These designs tap into Canadians' strong interest in the natural environment and beautiful landscapes without denying their urban culture or northern location. By a stroke of good luck, the site of the portage around the Chaudière Falls, let's see if I've got a pointer here, is also a sacred place for the Aboriginal people, peoples of the area and the First Nations of the region. That's why Confederation Boulevard is a masterful piece of symbolic art urban design. It retroactively links the nation's three founding groups, Quebec to the north, the French, the Aboriginal folks on the islands, and the British people in the south in Ontario. And the Riverside Museum of Civilization by Douglas Cardinal should be noted was designed by a Métis architect. Politicians and planners have to take care when adjusting the symbolic content of a capital. Monuments and memorials can privilege ruling elites and undermine minority rights or reduce patriotism in other groups. Hooray for our, for our ethnic group, Scots, Canadians in my case, might not be a good thing. The best strategy appears to shift from ethnic nationalism to civic nationalism, talking about our shared values. Canada's National War Memorial from the First World War was actually an early and surprisingly diverse example of this approach. Vernon March's The Response shows members of all armed forces and all ethnic groups, including Aboriginal soldiers, struggling for peace. More recent good examples include the Peacekeeping Memorial on Confederation Boulevard and a memorial on Parliament Hill to the famous five ladies who fought to have women recognized as legal persons. And finally, the national capital should be beautiful. It should connect the Canadian values by celebrating the region's remarkable landscape and promoting excellence in the design of public buildings, streets, and public space. The shoddy appearance of Ottawa and Hull in 1945 could be excused as a wartime hardship, but it was a national embarrassment for a country that wished to take its own independent place in the world. So, Annabelle asked me to talk about symbolic gestures. Here's a list from current proposals of um, initiatives that could make, in the next 50 years, Ottawa a more interesting and symbolically important capital for this country, my country. First of all, a First Nations Centre on Victoria Island um, to celebrate the culture of Canada's original peoples, designed with the flair of Douglas Cardinal's best work in Ottawa and Washington, perhaps. I think some of the obsolete mill buildings uh, near the Chaudière Falls should be reused as a new home for the Science and Technology Museum, moving its collection from an uninspired suburban warehouse. I think there should be a new portrait gallery, as Australia has done. Um, a national portrait gallery on Confederation Boulevard somewhere to be a teaching center about Canada's history. And I spent a very lovely afternoon there yesterday. It's a model I'm taking lots of pictures back. Um, I think the Canadian Charter of Rights and uh, Freedoms, a remarkable piece of constitutional uh, negotiation, should the original of it and the Constitution should be on display in the National Library and Archives right out on the street. Uh, I think there should be a monument to multiculturalism comparable to the sculpture outside Toronto's Union Station, also on Confederation Boulevard. I think there should be three new bridges built across the Ottawa River. It's embarrassing we haven't been able to build many bridges, symbolically or physically. And at least one of them should be prettier than this. That was what was there before. So if we can build that in 1843, the Union Bridge, surely we can do better than that. 
I think uh, there should be a streetcar system seamlessly interconnecting both sides of the Ottawa River using the existing bridges. I think there should be a free bus loop carrying visitors and residents, especially school children, around the Confederation Boulevard, connecting up all of the national institutions. I think there should be a water's edge walkway because it's at the bottom of the cliff. The walkway that was there in 1900 isn't so much there today. And I think there should be a water's edge level pedestrian bridge at least as beautiful as the one in Bilbao or Norman Foster's in uh, London. And finally, I think we should free the Shodi Air Falls, which have been dammed up, dammed up since the 1850s. We should bring back the boiling kettle falls that Samuel de Champlain saw in 1607 from 10 leagues down the river. And this is the plan by Algonquin elder William Conda, uh, Aboriginal visionary. Building these projects would boost the quality of life in the Ottawa Gatineau region, and more importantly, would create a Canadian capital that would inspire more pride in its citizens by physically expressing the history and interconnection of its three founding peoples and setting the stage for celebrating the country's values and culture. And now, part three to conclude. So what are the lessons both for Ottawa and Canberra and other young capitals? To build a capital city, you need to get four things right over a period of many decades. You need to get creative urban design and planning. You need excellent political management, broad political support and a political champion to start the implementation process. You need a good administrative organization. And you need sound management of long-term funding. And I hate to say it, since I've made a career in architecture and urban design, that's the easy bit. Urban design, obtaining a good plan for a capital city is easier than managing the political, administrative, and financial element needed to implement it. The most creative urban design work is usually obtained from some form of competition that's informed about local conditions and draws designers with broad experience from around the world. You folks, what we're celebrating here this year is a charter example of this. In a new political capital on a greenfield site, the entire city plan might be the subject of a competition as we saw in Canberra or Brasilia. Within an existing urban area, distinct districts have competitions for important capital city elements, like in Berlin and Helsinki. Buildings, monuments, or memorials should, that have symbolic content should always be commissioned by competition. And the best results almost always emerge from these competitive processes, such as Par uh, Paris's Grand Projet or Canberra's Magnificent Parliament buildings. There's a certain resistance in Western countries, some of them, to the competitive process. So I have to give this a plug as a design advocate every time I can. Design competitions increase political capital for you folks in the, the capital business because they avoid the appearance of patronage and corruption. They provide options for debate. They increase public awareness of a project. They're exciting. But many administrators dislike them because they feel they might lose control of the project or have to deal with these difficult, creative people. <laughs> now, others argue that competitions take too much time. We've got to get a shovel in the ground next month. So let's just have Harry, our good friend, design it for us. Um, but or they may cost too much. But if we consider the massive expense and decades typical needed to develop a capital city, Taking six months to get a good plan is probably a good investment of time and money. The trick is to unleash the creative thinking about design, the capital, without losing control of its implementation. It's neither necessary nor desirable to place the winning designer in charge of implementing the project. The best designers often lack the political and administrative skills needed and are often willing to spend, unwilling to spend decades, the rest of their career, on just one project. 
Now, Mr. Niemeyer in Brazil might be the exception that proves the rule, but he had lots of other work besides Brasilia. The best capital city planning agencies have administrators who are sensitive to design issues and determined to implement plans at the highest level of quality. For example, Walter Burley Griffin might not have been the best choice, he was the best choice to design Canberra, but he might not have been the best choice to build it. Especially when you have to deal with Australian politics, which seems to be some sort of blood sport, <laughs> and Australian bureaucracies, which seem to be some sort of, well, I can't, I can't come up with the right adjectives, so you can shout them out yourself. Sir John Overall's contribution might be a little more important here. Now, Sir John Overall, as you know, was an architect, but he's also a paratroop commander. That is the sort of thing that you might need to unlock. So the best implementing agencies run competitions for key projects, had outstanding urban design consultants available as advisors, you know, the best in the world at the time. It was the 50s, Holford was pretty good. In Canada, it was Jacques Robert from Paris in 1948. Um, and these agencies ensured that the local, cultural, environmental, and social issues were well understand, stood as part of the brief to the designers. And in existing urban areas, the best agencies planned in partnership with the local government. So there's some terrific competitions in Berlin that are co-sponsored by the federal government and the local co government in order to build the capital. Um, and the same in Helsinki. So, political support. Perhaps the most important lesson is that developing a capital city is a task that takes decades, so implementation must be structured for long-term success. Capitals can't be completed in one politician's term. President Kubitschek, am I pronouncing that right? Yes. Yes, the buildings were up, but they were empty. <laughs> they kept the construction going for another four years after 1960 in Brasilia. Um, and financial and political arrangements must be organized for continuity of action across regimes and to take advantage of boom periods in the economy. Canberra's experience is instructive. A hard push for a quarter of a century to get the minimum temporary capital in place. Inaction after the loss of political and financial capital during a quarter century of depression and war. Then another hard push after the 1950s during better economic and political conditions in the three decades after 1955. You Australians are not finished yet, and neither are we in Canada. So political champions, very handy at the startup. The main thing they can do is get you the powers you need and the financial arrangements you need. But you don't need them all the way through. That's the, one of the things we noticed. It's very important to have a champion at the beginning, but it's not, you don't need the strong per political leader to be at the helm for 100 years. You, you need the ability to, some form of arm's length public agency is a proven method around the world to implement a capital city plan. The type of agency must be closely matched to the type of capital and its stage in development. What Canberra needed in 1955 and Brasilia needed in 1959 is different than what they need today. The financial management, capitals need extra funds for symbolic content. It's not just a new town project outside of a major city. You need long-term capital financing for infrastructure, especially if you're building in a green field. You need the ability to borrow funds against future needs. You can't be just waiting for the government to give you this year's allocation. And the best agencies carefully guard the image of fiscal responsibility to maintain independence. Menzies was willing to give uh, overall money because they knew he was good with a penny. So, in conclusion, most capital cities have their fits and starts. Most have a terrible time getting started at all. And they have a hard time getting started because of the political, financial, and economic problems during their implementation. So you have to be, to, to implement a capital plan, you need to be really skilled over a period of 50 to 100 years at political management, implementation, have a good implementation agency, and a sound financial strategy. But in the long term, the capital city is often judged by the quality of the place that's created. 
So although management and an agency and a financial strategy are necessary, they're not sufficient. Long after the price is forgotten, the impact of design quality remains. For your legacy, you need excellent urban design. For example, the people of Australia spent, have spent several billion dollars building Canberra to date. The Griffin's plans cost them 1,750 pounds, prize money, perhaps $200,000 in today's money. When you stand on Mount Ainsley and it's not foggy, <laughs> and look across the lake to the new parliament, it's easy to argue that the people of Australia put good value for their prize money. Thank you.